Hey, Jeff. Thanks for being here. Let's go ahead and have a seat right there. Thank you. All right, so for those of you who Everybody. follow along on GeekWire, welcome, Jeff. It's Thank great you. to have you here. Great to be here. So if you follow along on GeekWire you, and you follow Amazon, you know that the Amazon tradition before any kind of uh, <laughs> high-level meeting is to work on a six-pager. This is the summary of what you're going to be pitching, talking about, uh, written first in press release form. So I, I have this six-pager here for Jeff. Uh, and uh, all of you, if you want to access it, it is in the GeekWire mobile app, for the GeekWire Summit mobile app. I promise, though, I, I thought about making us sit here and read it silently, <laughs> but uh, I promise I won't actually do that. When people first join the company and, it, and they happen to be on a teleconference, it's a little odd for the first 45 minutes to be silent. <laughs> Because we're yes. reading. Yes, and it would be just as odd here. But if you want to follow along in the app, you can get a sense for uh, sort of the framework that I've, I've created here for this. Jeff, how'd I do on the six-pager? I think it's terrific. It's the first time that uh, for this kind of thing, that's the approach someone's taken. So I applaud it. It was well-researched, very thoughtful, great okay. questions. All right, well, we'll see. We'll see how it, how it goes here. <laughs> All right, so I want to start by just getting to know you a little bit more. I think uh, some people refer to you sometimes as the other Jeff, but I think that somewhat diminishes your role. You are running a giant business at Amazon. Tell us about your upbringing. You grew up in Pittsburgh, and so you have a much different perspective, really, than a lot of folks here on the West Coast running tech companies. What did your history, your upbringing in Pittsburgh teach you, and how did it give you a different perspective on the world of tech? Well, I did grow up in Pittsburgh. Um, I was introduced to uh, my first computer in the 70s. It was a, a, a rotary uh, dial-up modem and a printer-based uh, terminal, and I, I was kind of hooked on the idea of uh, writing code. Uh, I didn't have a lot of places to go to, to learn, but I was really hooked on it. My first computer that we had at home was a Timex Sinclair 1000. Anybody had a, have a, yeah, all I think right. we saw that last night at the Living Computers Museum. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can't write a lot of really complicated things, but it was super fun. Um, I, uh, I grew up at a time when Pittsburgh was going through a transition uh, from kind of the industrial uh, uh, plant environment to some new uh, technologies and new businesses. Uh, I really like plants. I really like the people that work in plants. And it turns out when I got to Amazon, we were building distribution and fulfillment centers all over the country and all over the world. Uh, and I love them. I love to go visit. I love to spend time there. Uh, it really helped me make a transition. Yeah, very interesting. So tell us a little bit about your inspirations. Which technology and business leaders have had the most influence on you in your career, either through direct mentoring or, or studying by you? 18 years ago, um, I came from Allied Signal, which, was, uh, which is now Honeywell. Uh, the CEO was a guy named Larry Bossidy, who was a peer of Jack Welch's at GE and then left to run uh, Allied. Larry was a terrific business person, a great uh, operator. Uh, a really clear thinker. Uh, he taught me a lot about how to run a business, how to run an operation, uh, how to balance growth and profitability. Uh, it was great sort of training for me. That was, you know, 18 years ago uh, for about six years. Uh, I was fortunate in business school to meet a guy named Don Davis, who was the chairman of the Stanley Works, the tool company. Super thoughtful about leadership. Uh, one of the things he used to say is followers choose their leader. Uh, when he passed away a few years ago, some students uh, who knew him really well put together a collection of stories uh, in ways, about ways that he had influenced all of us. We called the book Do the Right Thing, and uh, it's, it was super fun to do it and to honor him that way, and I was really, uh, really lucky to, to have met him. And I've had a few other folks along the way, some non-business people, but, but business thinkers. Warren Bennis is somebody who I uh, deeply respect. Warren passed away a few years ago. Uh, and um, uh, a guy named Bob Thomas, who collaborated with Warren on some uh, leadership books. So I've been very fortunate. And of course, Jeff Bezos, the other Jeff, uh, and I have worked together for, uh, for 18 years, and I've learned a ton from Jeff. That's great. So it's the fourth quarter at Amazon. This is not your typical attire no. in the fourth no. quarter. You wear a flannel shirt to work in the fourth quarter at Every Amazon. Day. Why? Uh, well, I said, I, I, growing up in Pittsburgh, I came to like plants, and I love the, the people who uh, work in them. Um, when I was running operations during the fourth quarter, I would visit the fulfillment centers quite a bit. And I would always wear these flannel shirts uh, when I'd go out to visit. They're comfortable. Uh, I have a whole rack of them, a lot of flannel shirts. Uh, we used to send our corporate folks out to the field every holiday to pack boxes. And they were there to pack boxes, not for cultural transformation of some kind. 
when we no longer needed the corporate folks to go out to the fulfillment centers, I found the culture was getting a little bit more corporate in Seattle. We were a little less likely to talk about how amazing the folks in the FCs were and how they were just as dedicated to the customer as the people uh, that were working in corporate. And I wanted a way to create a link and remind everybody at corporate that there was all this work going on in dozens and now hundreds of faci facilities all over the world. So I started wearing these shirts that I would wear every day. And first day of the fourth quarter, someone will notice and say, oh, yeah, it's the fourth quarter. How are we doing in the FCs? Nice, nice. All right, so speaking of Amazon, let's, yeah. let's dive in. Sure. This company, if we could advance to the next slide here, if this company, this company oh, has- Wait a minute, so we have slides. Yes, we do have Sli some slides. It's a little unusual. Yes, I know, apologies for the PowerPoint. <laughs> this, the, the growth of this company has been astronomical. Um, when you joined Amazon 18 years ago, did you have any idea that this is what it would become? I mean, you've got now more than 380,000 employees worldwide. Yeah. Uh, no. That's, that's easy. No, I, I, uh, I was excited about what I thought was happening with tech uh, out here on the West Coast and eager to dive in. Uh, it seemed like operations were going to matter at Amazon, so it was a good place for me to start. But no, I, had, I, I don't think you could have predicted this. How has the company been able to handle all that growth? And what do you say to people who ask if you're getting too big, taking on too much? Because it sure seems that way from the outside. Well, in terms of handling it, I think part of the uh, trick for us has been the way we, that we organize work. We try to create, it's, it's like the difference between running a monolith as your architecture and a service-oriented architecture. Uh, so we organize around separable teams. The analogy is to a service that has a well-defined API that's hardened. Uh, we worry about the connections among services, but we try to make them as hardened as possible uh, and let the teams independently pursue their mission. Uh, when you do that, you can, you can create a lot of horizontal breadth. So what I think you're seeing is that we have been able to uh, get out of our own way and invest and invent for ourselves and, frankly, on behalf of a lot of other folks. I mean, some of the things that we've invented as we've grown our horizontal breadth uh, have enabled other people to invent on top of what we've built. So the third-party business, uh, our fulfillment by Amazon business, AWS, uh, our Kindle Direct publishing business. I mean, all, there are millions of people who are building businesses on top of these inventions that we sort of launched to the world. Uh, and so that's a part of how we've been able to do it is by letting others invent too. Um, your, the second part of your question is about this sort of, are we in too many things? And uh, there was a time when a management consultant probably would have told you to focus on just one thing and we would be in violation of this. Um, uh, I think it's okay because we are in, a great uh, many horizontal businesses, but there's a difference between horizontal breadth and vertical depth. What do you mean by that? In each one of these businesses, we have so much more invention ahead of us, so many competitors who are really nimble and smart and uh, taking care of customers, uh, trying to as well as, as we are. Uh, in retail, uh, we're probably 1% of worldwide retail. There's invention happening all the time. There are some great successful competitors in the United States, Walmart, Costco, Target, but outside of the United States, Tesco, Carrefour, uh, Yorobashi in Japan, uh, Aldi, who's, who's announced that they're coming to the US, uh, Alibaba, Wish. That, that space, that one vertical area has all of this competition and invention. And then you go over to the video side and you see all the things that we're doing there and what Netflix is doing and Hulu and others. AWS uh, is worried about and competing with you know, Microsoft and Google and IBM and Oracle. And so each of these areas is we're trying to keep separable to the extent possible, focused, and uh, we think there's lots of room for invention in each of them. Okay. Let's talk about the $5 billion elephant in the room. Yeah. Amazon HQ2. Yes. You surprised a lot of people with the announcement that you planned, the company plans to establish a second North American headquarters somewhere other than Seattle, yeah. although now Seattle is making a, a, pitch a pitch for it. Why? Why are you doing this? Well, I, I think it's a great opportunity. We're going to continue to grow. We have 50,000 people in Seattle. We're, we've announced that we'll have in the next year another 6,000 or so, 2 million square feet more coming on in Seattle. So we're excited about Seattle, but we want a, uh, another place where we can also grow. And it's a, you know, 50,000 employees somewhere else, $5 billion of investment uh, is a great opportunity for another city 
uh, to have the same kind of growth that we've experienced here in, in Seattle. And um, uh, we're hoping to create an equal second headquarters uh, where you know, it won't be sort of a, a second uh, to, the, to the main one in Seattle. We hope that they'll both be uh, equal and that the culture will thrive as it has in Seattle in, in the new headquarters. It, that's unprecedented in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, in terms of business drivers, what, what do you hope to accomplish? Um, apart from just having room and finding talent, what, what, what kind of business drivers are behind this decision? Well, that's really it. It's, it's room and talent and, you know, and, and, and sort of diversity of, of environment for people. I mean, not everybody wants to live in the Northwest. And I mean, it's been terrific for me and my family, but I think uh, we may find another uh, location allows us to recruit a different collection of employees, um, and that would be terrific too. I know Amazon is giving employees and executives the option of staying in HQ1 yeah. or HQ2. Yeah. Have you made a choice yet yourself? Or are you well, I wait? don't know where HQ2 is going to be. So you don't? It's not a foregone conclusion, and, uh, and, and I, I don't know. We'll see. Do, do, you, do you envision a day someday when there might be an HQ3? Possibly. It's a, that is a great question that nobody's asked me, and I, I think, uh, I, sure, at some point. But let's worry about HQ2 first. OK. Um, I, I was telling you before, I think, to me, this is a lot there's a lot of an analogy here to AWS and redundancy mm -hmm. and this whole idea of you don't want to have everything in, in one region. You know, uh, I was pointing out to you earlier, Toronto is a lot further from North Korea than Seattle. You know, it's so it, it sort of gets you, gets you some, some fail safe there. And also it's in another country. So my money is on Toronto. Tor okay. What, what do you think of that? Well, I think when we were talking earlier, you used the, I think the exact language you used is I, I'm convinced it will be Yes. And then you filled in Toronto. Uh, the number of times in the last few weeks I've had very smart people say, I'm convinced it will be blank, and blank is different in lots of cases. So we'll see. Okay. October 19th is the deadline for the RFP, and we'll be very data-based in our approach, and, um, and we'll be excited next year to announce the HQ2. What do you think about all the things, the, the ways that these cities out there are trying to get your attention? Uh, the cactus from Arizona, the city yeah. outside of Atlanta that wants to name it the, the city of Amazon. It, th is that going to work? Uh, I, you know, I think we're going to be more, more practical in terms of what uh, is important to us. I will say this, something that, uh, that I've been talking about when people ask me this question is I hope that we uh, choose a city that has uh, focused on STEM education, particularly computer science, uh, in the public high schools uh, and middle schools in the area. Uh, I, I think it's incredibly important. It's also a way for our employees to get involved in the local area. Um, so that would be one that I'd add to the list. Should, should folks in Seattle take it personally that you're planning to see other cities? Not at all. We, we, <laughs> no, we, uh, we love Seattle. Uh, again, 2 million square feet, 6,000 new jobs are coming here. It's been a great home for us and it'll continue to be so. Okay. Let's move on to the other giant news story, and that is Amazon's acquisition of Whole Foods, which you've sure. been intimately involved in overseeing. You talked to Whole Foods employees. It was probably my favorite SEC filing ever, <laughs> ever because it yeah. was a transcript of your conversation with Whole Foods employees after the acquisition was completed. You told them your personal story yeah. of your Whole Foods experience. I'd love it if you would share that with us. Well, I, uh, I woke up the morning of the announcement, and we, it was John Mackey and me on, kind of on stage with uh, all of the folks at corporate, and I, ordered, I went to the uh, hotel menu and ordered this amazing breakfast that had like quinoa and egg whites and all these fresh vegetables. And it was like, so I said to the group, I said, look, I'm a, I grew up in Pittsburgh, meat and potatoes guy. Uh, I got a chance to have a breakfast this morning that without Whole Foods probably wouldn't have uh, been on the menu. Uh, and for that, I'm deeply grateful. Whole Foods changed my life in terms of the way I eat. Uh, and I described the food. I said, you know, well, there's vegetables, uh, there, was quinoa, there were quinoa and other vegetables, and John Mackey literally said, uh, quinoa is not a vegetable. <laughs> and uh, so I learned some things about the culture, and uh, I, I learned that I have a lot, a lot to learn, and uh, I apologized uh, profusely to the, the crowd, and they didn't take it personally, so we're okay. Uh, talking casually with people who are Whole Foods and Amazon customers, some people looked at that and said, well, Whole Foods is a much more upscale brand mm. than Amazon. I've heard that reaction. Do you think that's the case? Uh, I don't know. I, I think there are lots of Whole Foods customers who are Prime members and lots of Prime members who are Whole Foods customers, and both groups are, uh, 
you know, our great, great sets of customers. Uh, we're going to try to do a lot to make Prime uh, really valuable for when you're shopping at Whole Foods. And we've already moved some of the Whole Foods items to our various uh, ways of delivering and ordering groceries on Amazon. So Fresh and Now and regular Amazon um, uh, grocery all have uh, Whole, Foods, Whole Foods items already, and there'll be more, more of those to come. What, what else, is, apart from the fact that quinoa is apparently a grain, not, not a vegetable? I, I think so. <laughs> What else have you learned so far from Whole Foods about retailing and the whole approach to grocery? Well, we, uh, well we've learned, of course, a lot about food, already about food, the food supply chain, the way they approach regional buying and sourcing uh, of, uh, of local fresh produce. I mean, that's been terrific. They invite uh, local small businesses into the Whole Foods stores uh, routinely to be a part of the experience, and uh, that's been uh, an amazing thing to watch. Um, I, we lowered the prices on day one. First day that we could, we lowered the prices. Uh, we, we lowered them on things like salmon and uh, uh, farm-raised uh, tenderloin and brown eggs and almond uh, butter and almond butter. And customers loved it. So that was. My, I, we we I was shopped. We purposely response. shopped before and after. Uh, shopping lists that cost eighty dollars before was less than sixty dollars after. All right, I love that. Yeah, love to hear that. So. So, Th thank you for shopping, by the way. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's, it's my job. Uh, so, we, you know, this is really an interesting combination of these two companies, in part because Amazon was really going it alone in grocery before this. You started uh, Amazon Fresh as a delivery service back in 2007 as a pilot here in Seattle. You have Amazon Go, you have Amazon Fresh Pickup. You know, you've got this array, and I'm not even naming them all. You've got this array, you know, the lockers yeah. you, you, of, of physical retail presence. It seems like some of this has got to shake out. What's going to go away here as you combine these two companies? Well, our approach before Whole Foods was to experiment to see what customers wanted. So we, as you, you listed, we tried Fresh. Uh, we've tried Prime Now, which is super fast delivery in, in less than an hour. Uh, we have a regular grocery business on Amazon that's doing fine for shelf-stable stuff. Uh, we have Prime Pantry. We have Subscribe and Save. We have the Go uh, experience, which is in beta for employees only. Um, and it, you know, at some point uh, soon, I'm sure that we'll be uh, opening that to the public. Uh, so we tried all these things. We did them in our separable way. We, we spun up teams that were focused on each one of those individually. One of the downsides of doing that is that you duplicate some things. You may c create some confusion for customers on the branding, and you may duplicate some tech, but you can move faster. So we've tried to experiment. We've learned in each of these. Whole Foods comes along. We have a great opportunity to partner with a, with a company that essentially invented the natural and organic category, uh, who we can learn a ton from. And what we're going to do over time is take the best of each of these and bring them together in ways that make sense to customers. So some of those, it seems, would go away or be streamlined. You wouldn't I think so. need that. I, one thing I've learned in my 18 years is that nothing is uh, permanent other than customers like low prices, not high prices, and a big selection, not a small selection. Yeah. You mentioned Amazon Go. This is the experimental store right now that's only open as a beta to employees at your headquarters, your new headquarters here in Seattle. Uh, that was originally expected to open in early 2017, early this year. It has been delayed. Mm. What's going on with Go? Oh, we're just, we're, we continue to experiment. So it's an employee uh, beta there. Uh, you know, it's, it's complicated to get this right. And um, the team is just, every day people are going in and grabbing, these are employees, grabbing items and walking out. And uh, we learn every time someone comes in. With groceries, you went from online delivery to physical stores and then a big brick and mortar acquisition. Clearly, groceries are just one sector of retail that Amazon is interested in. Would it be accurate to people to look at the evolution of Amazon's grocery business as a blueprint for your, your plans in fashion and books and other verticals? In other words, do you plan other big acquisitions in other areas of retail? I don't think this is a blueprint for us. We, we approach each of those uh, businesses with uh, a separate team. Uh, the, you know, the customer experience is a little different for soft lines versus grocery and consumables versus hard lines versus books. Uh, those teams are trying their own customer experiences and experiments. We have made acquisitions. We, we purchased a Zappos and Shopop uh, on the soft line side. Uh, but Whole Foods wasn't part of a grand 
plan that we've had for years. We, uh, there were a small list of people, if you had asked me a year or two ago, uh, that, uh, you know, who, if you had the chance to partner with someone in the grocery business, who would you want to partner with? And Whole Foods would have been at the top of my list, and when the opportunity came along, uh, we jumped at it. Earlier today, we had the Instacart CEO, Apoorva Mehta, on mm. stage talking about uh, his company's growth. How should we think about Instacart and Whole Foods and Amazon? Is that a relationship that, that you're engaged with? How does that work? You know, I, um, I really don't think that much about uh, competitors and their business models. We spend our time focused on customers. Oh, really? And, uh, <laughs> and we, I mean, we have 14 leadership principles, and one of them is very explicit about we pay attention to competitors when we can learn something tactically about what they're doing, like delivering really fast. Uh, but we obsess over customers. So I, I think there are going to be tons of winning models in this space. There's not just one way that groceries are going to get from farms and plants all over the world to homes and businesses in the United States. There are going to be lots of different ways. Okay. This is not a football game. There can be more than one winner. Um, so we're focused on trying to build a great customer experience for Whole Foods and Amazon customers. Just so you know, Apoorva said that he would be willing to talk with Amazon about purchasing back Whole Foods 1% stake he would. Okay. in Instacart. Just so you know, <laughs> I just, just Thank you. I wanted to pass that message Thank along you. from earlier today. Thank you, Todd. Uh, do, 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 you, do, you, uh, do you look at physical retail and online sales as separate things, or are they one? Oh, I, I think there's no doubt for me that it's, there's a, essentially a global retail market. Uh, customers don't say, you know, today I'm going to do my physical retail shopping and uh, tomorrow will be my online retail shopping day. Uh, they say, I, want, I need water or I need paper towels or I need a book or whatever it is. And if they happen to be out, they may stop at a physical store. If they happen to be sitting comfortably in their living room, they may order from Amazon. And I, I think you have to think about this the way customers do and consumers think about retail now. It may have been different 15 or 20 years ago, but now they think about retail. And certainly, uh, you know, when you look at the competitors that I pay attention to in terms of their pricing and their selection, it includes physical and online retail. Got it. You said that Amazon wants to be pioneers, not conquerors. Yes. But in the midst of all that pioneering, some competitors and political leaders are concerned that Amazon is becoming too powerful. How do you respond to that kind of concern? Well, look, we've, um, we've been around through four presidential uh, presidents and uh, dozens of leadership changes around the world, and uh, we don't spend time trying to figure out how our business model fits into uh, whatever the sort of prevailing uh, public policy issues are. We're spending our time thinking about customers, and I, I think if we continue to do that and demonstrate that the things we do are in consumers' interests, and we continue to invent on behalf of all these other small businesses. There are 600,000 jobs that have been created by small businesses selling on Amazon, and now over 50% of the units that are sold every day are not Amazon. They're sold by other companies that are using the services that we offer. Um, uh, there's so much opportunity in retail total to think about it as, uh, uh, you know, as, as one company uh, is, is likely to win, I think is just the wrong model. That there will be lots of winners, lots of different models. There's lots of time for invention. It's really early days. Yeah. All right, in the remaining time here, I want to jump into the future of technology in particular. Sure. Um, so far, Amazon is hiring more people than robots. Yes. If you look at the number of robots you're adding to your fulfillment center. About 80,000 yes. in the last five years and about 250,000 people. Yes, you, so you know the numbers. You're tracking it. Yes. Will that always be the case? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to say. I think for the foreseeable future, uh, that, that is going to be the case for the foreseeable future. As we add, one thing I know, if you look back at the last 100 years of, of technological change, it is kind of a myth that technology eliminates work. What it tends to do is change work. And what the, the group that benefits are humans, the customers, society, the folks who work uh, in environments that, uh, that employ robots then end up doing jobs that are more interesting, uh, less physically taxing, uh, that create more opportunities for advancement for them, uh, that maybe require them to have more of an education. I do think that in this age we're entering, lifelong education is going to be critical. I don't think you can, this model that 
you know, you finish college and you have your skill set for life, or you finish high school, or you don't even finish high school and that's your skill set for life. I think that, that era is over. I do think that uh, everyone is going to have to keep learning for their whole lives. This is why I mentioned STEM and CS before. I think it's vital that we make sure that public high schools are doing a great job of, of, of building the next generation of scientists and engineers, uh, and that it, it extends well beyond um, uh, high school. For us, the way we're thinking about this, we have a program called uh, Career Choice. We pay for our hourly f folks that work in our fulfillment centers, we pay 95% of tuition for fields that aren't really necessary for Amazon. So it's a chance for them to come work for us for four or five years uh, and then move on to a job that ha that's even higher paying uh, that requires higher skills if they uh, complete a college program. Over the past couple decades, shopping has moved from brick and mortar to web browsers to smartphones and now to voice, which you've been leading. What's next? Is, is VR the next natural place you'll put on a headset see the experience in front of you and pick out the, your items in the store? What is next? Well, I'm sure a lot of people in the room have experienced different AR and VR uh, techniques. Um, there are, I'm looking at Ed, his, his big smile in the front. I mean, there's some really cool stuff that's been developed, uh, but I think for it really to change our world, uh, sh you know, in shopping and uh, at Amazon, it has to work flawlessly. Uh, and none of the experiences I've seen so far are really flawless. There, there's just too much in the way of letting go and, and just experiencing something better than what you can do with the, our current devices. Uh, so I'm optimistic, as I always am, about technological change. I'm not ready to change my shopping habits anytime soon. Uh, automation is also extending to things like driverless cars and driverless trucks. How much so far have you seen automation and uh, autonomous driving change your fulfillment process, and how much do you expect it to change it in the future? This is a great question. You mentioned robots before. We're using robotics inside of uh, uh, very uh, set-apart fields that are dedicated for the movement of shelving. That's very different from autonomous vehicles and trucks on the road uh, because we can't control the environment in the same way. Uh, I do think that there will be great autonomous vehicles, including trucks. I think when there are fleets of them out there, we certainly would want to use them uh, at some point. I don't have a great idea of when that timeline uh, will reach the right point for us. Got it. What about drone delivery in the U.S.? You've made your first drone deliveries in, in the Cambridge, U.K. Yeah. I know that there's FAA issues. Are we realistically within a, a year or two of seeing actual commercial drone deliveries by you in well, the U.S.? It's hard to it's hard to predict the timeline. There are regulatory issues, uh, of course. Uh, I mean, we're talking about operating in, in or near commercial airspace, so there's traffic management problems that need to be solved really well. These, uh, these birds need to fly in uh, conditions that a commercial airliner would fly in, so wind and rain uh, and visibility issues. Has to land safely in a backyard, notice if there's a pet or a person there. I mean, these are really tough problems, and we're not going to launch until we get them right. Uh, teams made great progress. We have some amazing scientists and engineers working on this, and we're going to keep working on it until we get it right. Okay. My last topic here, Amazon Prime. It seems like a force of nature. You know, you've, you've got by some major. Are you a Prime member? What's that? Are you a Prime member? Of course. Okay, thank you. How so many Prime good. members do we have in the audience? Yeah. Wow. That thank is you. crazy. All right. Crazy. That's awesome. Yeah. It's our, it's our people. Yeah. yeah you're in Seattle. To buy a I guess. sample, but right. Yeah. What? How? How does Prime act as a driver for your business? And and could you offer any advice to the other folks in the audience? But like, could is there a way to apply the Prime model to other businesses that might be out there? Well, I don't know. I I, I uh, certainly you know the all you can eat is a very nice way to uh, approach uh, sort of guilt-free shopping. Um, it's, Prime has been uh, an amazing way to offer some process inventions uh, that we've built over time in terms of really fast, reliable delivery, uh, great supply chain that ensures we're in stock and all the items that, that people want, uh, a lot of focus on uh, uh, building waste-free and efficient processes so that we can offer low prices to customers. Uh, and you package all that up in a subscription called Prime. Uh, Prime members are loyal. They watch videos. They buy Echoes. They buy Echo shows for uh, their family and do drop-ins. Um, and uh, what's not to love? You didn't dispute my 80 million figure, I, I want to note. Oh, I didn't dispute your... Uh, Why haven't you said how publicly how many Prime members there are? Well, it's, it's changing all the time. Uh, and we're, we're just, we're not focused on... Uh, that, that kind of kind of external uh, communication, we're focused on making building as many prime members as we can by building great products for them, uh, and we think the rest will take care of itself. All right, 
Jeff, just final question here. You know, I could, I could sit here and pepper you with questions about Amazon for hours, and that's uh, in part a function of the fact that you are doing so much uh, as a company. Uh, what message would you want to get across to these folks that they might not have heard about Amazon, about where you're headed in the next two to three years? Is there anything you can tell us of, that might surprise us or, or, or basically get across more about where you're headed? I don't think it would surprise the people in this room. I, I really do, if you read my boss's uh, letter to the shareholders this year, uh, it was about how we stay a day one company. And I think most of the people in this room are here because you're building, aspire to build or have built day one companies. You're building companies that are changing the world that are, or doing activities that are changing the world that, uh, where you're experimenting every day and you might fail a few times and that's okay. Uh, you mentioned the word pioneering before. Uh, we're focused on looking around the world and saying, what can I make better today? Uh, that's what everybody here is doing. It's what we're trying to do. I, I hope for 18 years it's felt like that inside that even as it's scaled to be a more significant company, that it still feels small and special uh, and closely connected. Uh, I hope it always does. Um, if we can do that and continue to invent, I think we'll be happy with what the future holds for us. From your new home base in Toronto? From wherever it is. All right. <laughs> Jeff Wilkie, Amazon's consumer right. CEO. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Hey, that was fun. Thanks Thank a lot. Much. Appreciate you pointing that out.